Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied to you from God, our loving Father, and Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The word of our Lord to which we turn is found in the gospel reading. Particularly, we wish to focus on these words, the words of the Canaanite woman from verse 27. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. These are the words of our Lord. My dear friends and our Lord Jesus, our world's only Savior, numerous times in the past, maybe you remember it, I've taken opportunity to remind you all of the acronym GRACE. Spell that word downward and you can put together a phrase, God's riches at Christ's expense. I I bet you knew that maybe by now. Did you know that? Say it with me. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Now, if you did know it, good. That's exactly why I keep bringing it up. I want you to remember it. I recall the pastor from whom I learned those things, and I was an adult when I learned them, by the way, too, 35 or so years ago. And I found that an immensely rewarding and helpful way to explain to both young and old about God's grace and how we, how we receive it. And precisely because grace is a gift, we don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. None of us do. And God's word today highlights this truth. You don't deserve this. So, from the Gospel reading, Jesus had just withdrawn from the Galilean region into Gentile, non-Jewish territory. Uh, If I was to do a map for you, I'd do it like this. I would have the Sea of Galilee here, and the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea, kind of like a hot dog on a string. And then over here would be the, the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, And then up here would be Tyre and Sidon, out of the range of Israel. And that's kind of key to understand. Jesus was walking up there, and the reading begins that way, because he just hacked off a bunch of the Pharisees. And who were they? They were those fastidious keepers of the law who, when anybody was breaking any little thing of the law, they would remind them, and they would make sure that they looked very prim and proper and keep all the man-made things But Jesus reminded them to their faces the things that God has commanded, you've ignored. And they were hacked off about that. And they plotted against Jesus, and so he withdrew from there. Now Jesus was journeying in this Gentile region. It's about 40 miles away from the Sea of Galilee. And and a woman of that territory comes out to Jesus to meet him. His fame had gone out. It had gone all through the countryside. Fame about feeding 5,000 with just a small lunch that a boy had brought. That was just the men numbered, plus women and children. Fame about feeding 4,000 on another occasion. Fame about healings, about casting out demons, about raising the dead. Jesus' fame had gone far and wide, and this woman has heard of him. And she comes because she's got a problem. She's got a daughter who's severely tormented by a demon. I have no idea what kind of manifestations that took, but I trust the word of God here. She's in great grief because her daughter suffers so. Any parent would be like this. But this woman is not among the group, Israelites that is, Jews, to whom Jesus has been sent and toward whom he has geared his message. The woman comes. She's not a descendant of Abraham. But rather, she's a Canaanite. She's actually descended from those race of peoples who had lived in the promised land before Israel was given their inheritance. And because of their gross idolatry and wickedness, God had commanded that they be utterly exterminated. Israel hadn't completed the job. And she is a survivor from generations. And... She's certainly heard of Jesus, for she comes and listen how she speaks. She speaks like an Israelite, like a believer, begging for mercy. Begging for mercy for her demon-oppressed daughter. Addressing him as Lord, son of David. Nobody does that but an Israelite, a Jew. 
This is her chance. This is her chance for Jesus of Nazareth is nearby and he's passing by. Earlier we read that Psalm 67. And that psalm adds to this thought where God's word says, not once but twice for emphasis in the structure of the psalm, let all the peoples praise you. And then in the middle of it, it says, let the nations, the Gentiles, be glad and sing for joy. You see, God is about the business of doing something far bigger than the Jews were imagining God was doing when they thought he's just saving us. With this psalm, and there are others like it, trust me, with the Old Testament coupled uh, with Isaiah 56, God had always intended, and you can see it plainly, he had always intended to gather the nations unto himself. It goes way back to Genesis chapter 12 when God said to Abraham, I will bless all the nations of the earth through you. He meant through Christ. And now he gathers people by faith, just like he gathered all through the ages, by faith. Just like he gathered Abraham, you read in Genesis 15, and Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And this woman is yet another example of God gathering foreigners unto himself. Now, you might ask, if you understand the situation of the first century church, how did so many of the Jews miss this idea? Because they all thought it's just us and we're in, thankfully, by birth. How is it they could have been so mistaken? It was right there in the Word of God and it's in a lot of places. But it's possible, and we have to acknowledge it is possible to blindly miss or overlook or ignore key things in God's word, which yet is another occasion for me to remind you how God, the Holy Spirit, desires for all Christ's children to humbly approach his word in a daily fashion so that he can work with us and shape us and mold us. Back to that Canaanite woman now. I'm going to be gesturing a little bit, so I want, to know, I want you to know what I'm gesturing about. When I'm speaking about the Canaanite woman, I'll be gesturing here. If I'm speaking about Jesus, who, where should I gesture? Oh, let's try there. How's that work? And when I speak of the disciples, just I'll, I'll enlarge my arms around me like I've got some other people standing with me here, okay? So this will make more sense. Because on the surface, it seems like it's just an encounter between Jesus and the woman and the disciples are standing back and they say, Jesus, do something. But it's more involved than that. It really is. So the woman comes. She's heard about Jesus and his wonderful deeds. Whatever she knows about Jesus, she addresses him like an Israelite would, son of David and Lord. And, and we ask, is it really possible that she believes rightly? Surely, Jesus can help her daughter. That's what she really is clinging to. After all, no one else has been able to help her, and she's in great distress. So she comes crying out, not one-time thing, but here's where paying attention to the verbs makes a difference. This is why they make pastors learn Greek to do this. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. <clears throat> you might get the idea she said this once, maybe twice. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. And the disciples are all standing here and saying, Jesus, get rid of this lady. She's a pest. Something like that. She comes crying out. And oddly, it shows that, it says that Jesus didn't say a word to her. It's like he ignored her. And that gets the disciples involved, so they, they turn their attention to Jesus. And you hear what they say. Send her away, for she's crying out after us. So the sense is that the disciples are asking Jesus to give her what she wants, get her on her way, so that they can have some peace again. 
So they're really kind of going to bat for her in a sense that not out of love, but out of just to, to be rid of her. I don't know if that's the best motive for the disciples, but I, even we sometimes do the right things out of wrong motives, right? So Jesus, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. Yeah. And Jesus' answer now makes sense. He's talking to the disciples in the woman's presence. And he says, uh, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the woman hears this. She hears this. And what does she do? She hears, remember her desperation. And now she's kneeling like a beggar. And she cries out again, knowing she deserves nothing. Lord, help me. And Jesus speaks rather oddly to our ears. But it seems it might have been a commonly known proverb in his day. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. So it's kind of like Jesus is serving a pricey banquet and this woman is a party crasher. She has no place at the table here, for she's not a descendant of Abraham. Right now it's time for Jesus to serve the Jews, to bring the gospel to the Jews, and God's going to take it forth from there. That's why Jesus was sent. But the woman speaks up and shows her faith, and I'm paraphrasing her now, as she says it. Yes, Lord, you're absolutely right. It would be bad to try to deny or contradict God's plan to save his ancient people, Israel. You are indeed Israel's Messiah, and the bread you give belongs to the children. I agree and believe, and I don't want the children's bread, because when the children eat, the dogs also get to eat, don't they? The bread of the Messiah is so abundant, so overflowing, that parts of it will fall from the table. Onto the floor, everyone should know that. I know that. The bread belongs to the children, and when the children eat, the rest of us get something too. We need nothing more than the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She understands. She agrees with Jesus that it isn't right to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. But she also recognizes that Jesus is using a figure of speech here so that anyone who understands that they don't have privileged position with God, we come as deserving nothing. We need crumbs. Those crumbs will be sufficient. Now, think about this. I suppose this woman could have taken offense at Jesus. What? Are you calling me a dog? I'm out of here. Think about that. She could have stopped off in a huff thinking that Jesus had treat her, treated her in an unbecoming manner. But she didn't take offense. This is what is so refreshing about people of humility. Humble people, they don't make you tiptoe on eggshells lest you offend them. They recognize their place, and they're grateful. They're grateful too, just real to the core, genuine. And God attaches a special blessing to this humility. The Lord's Apostle James would write in chapter 4, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And then the Lord's Apostle Peter wrote something that's almost parallel to it. He says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Oh, does God's word then in this passage call on us? To renounce all pride and prideful ways and to look to the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus and the eternal life that he now offers to all and for us to say, I don't deserve this. Thank you. The woman displays the humility of faith. This is what's refreshing. The kind of humility that truly appreciates what it receives always knowing that we are undeserving. It's the kind of humility you display when you know you don't belong somewhere, when you're considered an outsider, 
and unclean among the clean. I hope you can clearly see where we fit alongside this gospel reading. Aren't we all considered outsiders? Like this Canaanite woman, we're not of the seed of Abraham. I don't know of any of us who traces our genealogy to the Jews. But more importantly, we were born into sin. Unclean. Yeah. On our own, we wouldn't recognize Jesus for who he is. In our blindness, we too, like the Pharisees, would scoff and mock and reject him out of hand. But God has been at work in you. God has been at work in you through the gospel. God, the Holy Spirit, has called you through the gospel. And thanks be to God, the scripture makes it clear that God is working on a much bigger plan than just to save the children of the flesh of Abraham. But rather, he's desiring to save people of all kinds across our planet to receive through faith what Jesus has earned freely for you and for me. Does your persistence come near that of this woman? <clears throat> I can speak for me. I'd probably say, well, I guess I won't make a scene. I'll just leave Jesus go and turn away. He's ignored me. This woman, man, what an example. Do we keep on asking, keeping on seeking, keeping on knocking like Jesus said to do in Matthew chapter 6? Too often, not. Her example puts us to shame and again calls us to repent and to hear the voice of Jesus who has pronounced blessing to the persistent. What Jesus came to bring us is a rich feast. A rich feast, not merely of food, but of spiritual blessings that begin with the forgiveness of sins and peace with God, but continue with all kinds of other blessings that spill forth all through the physical realm as well. And they all come to us because of Jesus, the Son of God, who bore our sins in his body on the tree to bring you and me to God. Having atoned for our sins by the shedding of his blood, having rested in the tomb and been raised from the dead, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed in his name. You're justified before God. You are forgiven. I don't deserve that. Neither do you. Hey, welcome. Welcome to God's family. Jesus Christ is rich in mercy, and he has achieved the victory. His Easter resurrection from death is that that seal of approval, the assurance that sin, corruption, the broken and twistedness of our world is not the final word, for God has intervened. For there's a word of forgiveness, a word of pardon for our sin. It only comes as we rely upon Christ, as we lean upon him, as we continue hearing his word. But it's an abundant pardon. Sufficient for all peoples. I'm reminded of the words of the Lord's Apostle John in chapter 2 of his first letter. Where he says, Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Yeah, powerful. It's such an abundant pardon. Such an abundant peace. That even crumbs leftovers from Jesus will be enough to satisfy. We don't deserve it, of course not. But yet he gives it freely because that's how he is. Great was her faith. And in what did this greatness consist of? Two things. She knew Jesus as Lord, son of David. She knew him to be who the scripture promised him to be. And she knew that Israel's Messiah Jesus would have such an abundance that there would be something left for her, even the crumbs. Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And so, by Jesus' account, on account of her great faith, her daughter was healed that very hour. What a marvel. What a marvel. 
Even more marvelous is that God has preserved this word for us to this very day. And Matthew, from whom this account comes, has been diligent to present to Israel their king and Messiah, Jesus. And he's included some other outsiders, too. Think about it. In chapter 2, way back in January, we saw magi summoned from the east by a star. That had to be a God-doing thing, right? God calling outsiders, foreigners, to come and to worship his son. We saw in chapter 8 a Gentile centurion commended by Jesus for his great faith. Why? Because he says, I'm a man under authority. I know how this works. I say, go to my servant, and he goes. I say, come to this one, he comes. And you, Jesus, you have all authority. And Jesus says, I tell you, I've not seen such great faith in all of Israel. And now we see a woman, this woman, foreigner. She knows she doesn't deserve what she receives or requests, but she trusts in mercy, the mercy of Christ. And she, too, not only receives prayer answer to it, but she receives Christ's commendation. Commendation. Think of it. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, grant us, too, the humility to realize that of all the good we receive from you, we don't deserve it. And to rejoice in dining from the crumbs of our Savior and Master's table of abundance. Amen. Now may God's rich peace guard and preserve your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.